Hello and welcome to Germany Today. My name is Dumi Tlapo, bringing you the best of what's going down in and around Johannesburg. The city of Johannesburg recently celebrated its 130-year celebration at Rand Club, which is one of the iconic buildings linked with the development of the world's greatest goldfield, as well as the emergence of modern South Africa. Let's check it out. It is said that every gentleman needs a space to unwind and relax. The Rand Club, built in 1904, was such a place. Now being one of Joburg's historical buildings, the Rand Club invites every Joburger, including women too, to utilize its phenomenal space. So Brian, how important is the Rand Club in Johannesburg today? I think the Rand Club is an important institution. It's important because it's got an incredible history. So the club's been here since one year after Johannesburg was founded. So it was established in 1887. Joburg was established in 1886. Um, so it, it really is a very important part of the history of Johannesburg. And additional to that, obviously, it's this really beautiful building. Um, so I think in a city where we've got a lot of contemporary buildings and slightly questionable contemporary buildings, um, it's amazing to still have a club that functions in a beautiful clubhouse like the Rand Club. So let's take a step back, take us way back in time and tell us why the Rand Club was established in the first place. Where we're sitting now is basically in the middle of the largest gold field in the world. Um, so there was this huge, very wealthy gold field. There were all these mining magnets. A lot of them had come out from England. And in England there was this idea that a gentleman had to have a club. So your club was like your home away from home. Um, and obviously you're sitting on this dusty gold field and it's kind of a little bit rough and you need a little bit of England that comes back to Joburg with you. So they decided to form a club and they based the Rand Club on the Reform Club in London, which is this like crazy posh club. If you've watched Around the World in 80 Days, it's the place where Phileas Fogg and all of his friends meet. Um, so Rand Club was based on that Reform Club. So what is the next step? What's the future plans for Rand Club? The future plans are always, it's always an interesting question. Um, I think the club has had a slightly tumultuous time in the last sort of 18 to 20 months. Um, it's tried to adapt. Uh, I think, you know, if you look prior to 1994, only men were allowed to be members and they'd have to be white and there's a story that they couldn't be Jewish. Um, it's a much more inclusive club today. So if you look right behind where we're sitting, there's a picture of Nelson Mandela, who was a member of the club. Tabo Mbeki is also a member of the club. And I think there's been quite a concerted drive to try to make the club more inclusive and to try to make it more relevant to a contemporary South Africa. So uh, the hope really is that this will continue as a social club, but it will become a meeting place not just for captains of industry or sort of wasps, um, but a meeting place for uh, an interesting strata of contemporary South African society. So, you know, people all the way from the Mandelas or the Mbekis, uh, Tokyo Sekwale is also a member, all the way through to kind of like the old mining families, uh, like the Oppenheimers and then younger, sort of more interesting young people as well. So there, there are actually quite a number of young people who've joined the club um, and from all sorts, of, all sorts of walks of life. So young entrepreneurs, architects, doctors, a couple of people in banking. So it's still a good place to meet new people um, and to socialize and to do interesting things. So I think the concerted effort, um, and perhaps it's something that needs to be explored uh, in more detail, is really to try to become more relevant and more exciting uh, and more accessible to young South Africans, and particularly young South Africans from all stratas. So you're not just looking at the traditional white male membership, it's, it's starting to look at uh, young black members as well um, and how to appeal to young black members um, because obviously to stay relevant in South Africa uh, you, you have to appeal to everyone you can't and I mean it's, it's really what South Africa is about today um, not not trying to only uh, reach out to one group of people so really the concerted effort now is to encourage young black and even female members uh, to, to join the club um, and I think they're also they're quite open to ideas um, and to finding out what appeals to all sorts of younger people. So the club is, yeah, they're very open to ideas of what people would like to see happening in the space and what will draw them into the space. So it's, it's really an open dialogue. Um, and I think 
it, it, that's what makes the future more exciting and more dynamic, is to actually be able to see what people want to do and to do new and, and exciting things that appeal to them. 1904, I wouldn't have been able to walk here. Do you want to know why? Because I'm at the Rand Club, which was once a gentleman's club only. But today, it is open to everybody. This includes females as well, bringing every Joburger to come right here and utilize this beautiful historic building. Since 1994, it's been open to female members. Before that, it was very, uh, it was forbidden. I think women were not allowed in the club unless they were accompanied by a male member. And in fact, the story is that when Princess Elizabeth, who's now Queen Elizabeth, was in South Africa in 1948, when she visited the club, she wasn't allowed at the central staircase. Um, so it's definitely a very different club than what it was at that stage. Corner Love Day and Fox stands a gentleman's club that invites everyone to come have that piece of cake right here at Rand Club. I'm Lebegang Makudu for Joburg Today. Hi, I'm Danny Glover and you're watching Joburg Today. Like us on Facebook, JoburgToday.tv and follow us on Twitter at Joburg Today. Not Without a Fight is a book based on Helen Ziller's personal story. She recently launched the book in Johannesburg and of course we were there to chat to her and find out more. To meet you. Helen Ziller, welcome. What a pleasure to meet with you today. Congratulations on this book that you've just written. I haven't read it as yet. Obviously you've just launched it but the title itself, Not Without a Fight, comes across as a Helen Ziller book. That's because you're a fighter. But what does the title mean to you personally? Well, it's a story about South Africa's transition and it's also a story about my journey within that process. And what I meant by the title is that it's been a personal and political battle and that no democracy has ever been established sustainably without a battle by many, many people for the things that are essential in a democracy. That is what the title means. It also refers to the struggles and challenges of raising a family as a working woman. It really looks at life as being a series of challenges and uh, struggles and triumphs and failures. Well, I'm not sure if my story will resonate with women per se. I hope my story resonates with every person who's trying to achieve something and have a family life at the same time and feels they've got a purpose in life. I hope every individual will find that the book speaks to them. But it was really good for me to be very honest about my own life, my family's life, which of course, like all lives, isn't by any means all rosy. And I think that I wrote my story as honestly as I could. There has been little snippets from your book already published. And the sense that I get is that this book has many revelations about your role as a politician. The story is described here as to be about political intrigue, treachery, floor crossing and unlikely coalitions. We are living in the reality of coalitions right now, but give us a sense of what you mean when you say the story is about treachery. No, well, there are many chapters devoted to the treachery of the story. It sometimes reads like a film script, quite frankly. It takes people behind the scenes of politics and it shows them just how difficult the cut and thrust of political intrigue is and how Machiavellian politics can be. But I hope it also shows the other side, how noble politics can be and how the challenge and the battle between noble and evil ends threads its way through politics like it does everywhere else in life. In particular, you mention your relationship with Lindiwe Mazibuko as well as Rampela Mampela. You, you speak about backstabbing and treachery with regards to those relationships. How difficult was it for you? Well, I wouldn't say that um, Mampila or Lindiwe represent the negative poles in politics, not at all. I think that they are both very fine people and very strong people. But if you read about the machinations surrounding floor crossing, about the attempts to capture the procurement system in the city of Cape Town, about the struggles for electoral lists, that is Machiavellian. But the story about Lindiwe and Mampila is the story of human beings who weren't aligned at a critical moment when I'd hoped we would be. It's a very interesting time in South Africa right now. Uh, South Africans are speculating what to expect come 2019. What are your expectations for the 2019 elections, given the traction the DA has gained following the last local elections? 
Well, two and a half years is a very long time in politics, so it's very hard to predict with any accuracy what is going to happen in 2019 in the next national election. A lot depends on what happens to the ANC in the meantime, and their voters generally turn out in greater numbers in a national election than they do in a local election. And it also depends about how the DA does in opposition and in government where we govern. But politics is a contestation now between three different colours, and those colours are blue, yellow and red. And I think we've taken South Africa to a new level where we have gone beyond the old, obsolete black versus white discourse to look at policies and principles and practice. And that is what is so good about it. And so in the next election, I hope people will leave this terribly polarizing race discourse behind us and talk about blue policies, yellow policies, red policies in terms of the DA, the ANC and the EFF, and then decide what is best for our country, what is best for everyone. That's all for today. For more on the city, do check out our playlist. From myself, Dumin Tlapo, and the Joburg Today crew, it's goodbye.